Hello and welcome to our Baptist History Tour of England and Wales. The aim of this video is to help people investigate the best sites of Baptist history interest in these two nations. Whether you are arriving from other countries already living here, we hope you'll find this video helps you to plan a trip. My name is Adrian Gray. I'm historical advisor to Pilgrims and Prophets, a community Christian heritage organisation based in Nottinghamshire and Lincolnshire. We have divided England and Wales up into eight separate areas, all with their own specific Baptist history interest and character. Now, I'll have to say that this isn't everything of Baptist history interest in these two countries, but it will allow you to plan a visit and probably satisfy most people. Most of the areas we've used would actually make a good day trip in themselves, except perhaps Wales, where you probably need two days due to the extra travel. Now, some of the areas are actually very close together and you can visit perhaps two zones using one centrally placed hotel. For example, areas three and four are easy to visit together and so are areas one and two. If you'd like more advice on how to plan a trip around the country, then Pilgrims and Profits do provide free travel advice to people visiting the UK from overseas. So just email us or contact us through our website or Facebook page in order to get some advice on what to do. Area number one on our map is West Lincolnshire and Nottinghamshire. This is an essential area to visit if you're interested in Baptist history, because it's the home country of John Smith, Thomas Helwys and the separatist congregation that moved to Amsterdam and became Baptist in 1609. And of course, Thomas Helwys then returned to England. This area is only about 90 minutes by train from London, so it's easily accessible. Once you get here, we at Pilgrims and Prophets can organise a guided tour for you. Uh, to do this by yourself, you'd certainly need a car. If you're doing Area 1 and Area 2, you could actually stay in the same place. Lincoln, Retford or Gainsborough are ideal. Now, this is an area of great importance for English Christian history. Not only is it important for the early Baptists, but it's important as the home birthplace, in fact, of Thomas Cranmer and also of John Wesley. So we really do recommend, if you're interested in wider church history, of setting aside at least half a day to visit Epworth and hear Wesley's hometown described in his own words. The area is also associated with the Mayflower Pilgrims and Lincoln Cathedral is spectacular, arguably the best medieval cathedral in Europe. Uh, as you can see here, there's a number of features of interest in the area, and we're going to talk about one or two in a little bit more detail. Well, I particularly love visiting Sturton Le Steeple. Uh, this is a little village with actually quite a big church, and it's a remarkable place in English Christian history. There are several people from this one tiny village of great importance. For example, in 1546, uh, one young man from the village, John Lascelles, uh, was became a very significant Protestant martyr when he was executed uh, in the last days of Henry VIII's reign for his advanced views about the nature of the bread and the wine. But this is important for Baptists as the village where John Smith uh, was born. Well, we don't know precisely where he was born, but in the district of Sturton Le Steeple. And of course, he was the man who went to Amsterdam and famously became a Baptist. But it's actually also the home village of John Robinson, who was the uh, leader of the Mayflower Pilgrim Congregation once they were in Leiden in the Netherlands. He was born here a few years after Smith. And one of that, uh, one of his family, one of his in-laws, in fact, Catherine White, married John Carver and actually went on the Mayflower and died in Massachusetts in 1621. Now, if that's not enough reason to visit Sturton Le Steeple, you can actually just go down the road two miles from this village to a tiny place on the River Trent called Littleborough, where in the year 627, uh, probably the largest baptism that took place in the whole area occurred, 
when Paulinus and King Edwin of Northumbria uh, organised the baptism of the people of Lindsay. So we have there a very, very early site of baptism in the waters of the River Trent, making this a fascinating place to visit. Now, we don't know precisely where John Smith actually was born or lived, although he has been connected with the lost settlement of Hapelsford. And by lost, I mean it's actually been completely uh, demolished over the years, fell apart and no one lives there anymore. So you can enjoy a very pleasant little walk along the banks of a beck to the site of where Hadwellsfort Church once stood. There's just one or two gravestones that are left there. This is actually a site which has connections probably to both John Smith and to Thomas Helwes because one of his family lived here and owned some land as well. So a worthwhile little diversion. An important place, indeed a central place in the story to visit, is the town of Gainsborough, which stands just inside Lincolnshire on the River Trent. Here you can walk around the lanes and along the riverside where John Smith and his friends formed a separatist congregation in about 1606. You can see the parish church where he preached without permission in 1604. He actually got into trouble for that. And also where the future Baptist had one of his children christened. From the church, it's just a few yards down to the quayside on the River Trent. Here you can see more or less the place where Thomas Helwys organised the escape of the separatists in 1607. And of course, very famously, he organised that escape not only for the Gainsborough congregation, but for the Scrooby ones who became the future Mayflower pilgrims. And there's a very delightful little statue down on the riverside showing the pilgrim woman, but I like to think she could equally well have been a future Baptist. Smith's great friend, although they later fell apart, was Thomas Helwys, who organised the escape from Gainsborough. And Helwys came from a few miles away from the village of Ascom, a delightful quintessential English village. This was the traditional home of the Helwys family, probably where Thomas was born, although we can't be certain of that. What you can do in Ascombe is visit the wonderful parish church uh, sitting on top of a little hill as you can see in this picture and you can also see behind the church the old almshouses, almshouses that are actually founded by money provided by Helwys's family. Thomas Helwys, who was to become the second member of Smith's Baptist congregation, obviously lived at Ascombe, therefore, but he went off to London for legal training and then returned to Broxtow. He lived at Broxtow Hall from 1595. This was a house which his father had leased, and it seems that Helwys worked in business uh, management in that area. Now, the house has long since been demolished, but you can still visit a road called Broxtow Hall Close, and in that road is this impressive old stone wall, which is the last remaining section of some of the buildings associated with the hall. It was probably here that Helwys married Joan, his wife, possibly at a long lost Broxtow Chapel. So it's an impressive and interesting place to visit on our tour of England and Wales. So Helwys may have had his own chapel at Broxtow Hall, uh, but his parish church was in the village of Bilbra, and that's just a mile or two from where the site of Broxtow Hall can still be found. It's possibly he was married here, but certainly this was his parish church, and certainly this is where he would have come for the funeral of his father. In fact, he erected a memorial to his father, which is one of the few physical traces of Thomas Helwys that we have still surviving in this country. And here in my pictures, you can see the Helwys family memorial that he put up uh, and also the interior of the church, which is very beautiful paintings that have been added here much more recently. At about the time of the separatist crisis in 1606, Helwys moved away from Broxtow and moved to Basford. It's possibly where his wife 
came from. So it was to Baseford that John Smith came to stay with him in about that date, 1606-1607. And this was at a time when Smith seems to be going through something of a spiritual crisis and perhaps a personal crisis over the whole matter of the separation and all the implications of that. Uh, we know that while he was here, Smith was in trouble for preaching illegally at Baseford Church, although it has since been very substantially rebuilt. Smith was actually fined two shillings and sixpence. Now, Smith and Helwes had a friend, John Herring, and John Herring was the minister in Baseford from 1605. He'd actually come from a church that they'd been previously both interested in, or Smith particularly, at Marnham, uh, where Smith had actually been involved in a riot over control of the church in 1604. It's possible that Joan Helwes, Thomas's wife, was from Baseford. There was a Henry Ashmore, Ashmore was her maiden name, of Baseford, who was a miller and nonconformist in 1598. But this is now very much an industrial suburb of Nottingham, uh, and perhaps interesting to add to the story, although not a lot to actually see to make it a priority on our tour. There's certainly much more to see in the village of Saundby in Nottinghamshire, actually just a mile or two from Gainsborough. And this is really one of my favourite places to visit. It's really a forgotten medieval church that you access through a farmyard. Very, very quaint. And all our American visitors love going to Saundby. Why it matters is that this church was uh, the home church, effectively, of Thomas Helwes's cousin, Sir Gervais. And it was under the name of Sir Gervais that Helwes hired a boat that they escaped from Gainsborough inside of, or the women and children actually were inside of it. In Saundby Church, you can find another Helwes family memorial. This, is, uh, this one was paid for by Sir Gervais for his father, who of course was Thomas's uncle. Now, it's curious that both Thomas Helwes and Sir Gervais died about the same time. Thomas disappeared into prison, whereas Sir Gervais was actually executed in 1615 due to problems that he ran into while he was in charge of the Tower of London. But this is a fantastic place to visit with a lot of Baptist and Helwes family connections. Now, just round the corner from where Thomas Helwes lived at Ascombe is the village of Gamston. And inside the parish church there, we've actually got a new exhibition on Baptist history. The reason why Gamston is important in Baptist history is that it was the, the baptismal place of Dan Taylor, who's often referred to as the Baptist Wesley, the man who revived Baptist fortunes in England during the 1700s and actually planted the Baptist church into Yorkshire. Uh, um, Taylor had left Yorkshire trying to find somewhere to be baptised uh, and happened to actually come across somebody from the Gamston church on the road who directed him to their local minister. And so this is where Taylor was baptised. Had it not been for him, the Baptist may well have been in terminal decline in England by about 1800. Now, just a few miles away from Area 1 is our Area 2, the eastern side of Lincolnshire. This is a lovely area of undulating wolds and expansive fens. You can visit the area quite easily if you're staying in Boston or Lincoln. And of course, Boston is very famous in its own right for its spectacular church and its links with John Cotton and the Puritans, particularly Puritans who went to America in the 16, late 1620s and early 1630s. There's much of Christian interest in this area. We might also mention Rafeby Chapel, one of the first Methodist chapels built anywhere, and the lost village of Sempringham, where there was a medieval monastery and where the Great Migration to America was planned in 1629. So this is a fascinating area. It contains one or two interesting early Baptist churches, uh, Coningsby was one and Boston is another, and the spectacularly uh, fascinating church at Monksthorpe. One fascinating location in East Lincolnshire is Stallingborough Creek. 
This is where Thomas Helwys uh, brought the various uh, refugees, I suppose we'd have to say, to try and escape to the Netherlands. And while they were here, they were surprised by the authorities and Thomas Helwys was actually arrested. Now, years ago, some American Congregationalists came here to put up a memorial for the Mayflower Pilgrims, who of course were part of the group that was arrested. They put it up in the wrong place and subsequently moved it to Immingham Park. But the actual location where this really happened is easily accessible by footpath. So actually, if they put the memorial in the correct place in the first place, there would be no problem. But it's a, an emotional place to visit for many people. From Stalingrad, it's about a 40 minute drive down some, through some very lovely scenery indeed of the Lincolnshire Wolds to the remote little country chapel of Monksville. Uh, this is actually one of the earliest Baptist chapels surviving in this country. It was built in about 1701. It's one of the few that has a surviving outdoor baptistry. Now, I've not myself seen anyone actually using it, but I'm sure we could arrange something if you so wish. This area is particularly associated with the Baptist theologian Thomas Grantham, who was of great significance in the growth of the Baptist movement in the district in the late 1600s. Not far from Monksthorpe and the principal town in the district is the town of Boston with its spectacular and famous parish church known widely as the Boston Stump. Boston is a town associated with the early Reformation. It's actually the hometown of John Fox, the famous author of the Book of Martyrs. But for our story, it's particularly important as the place where the Gainsborough and Scrooby congregations first attempted to escape from the country and indeed were in fact uh, betrayed. So some of the future Baptists were arrested here and briefly held in prison. The town's also famous for John Cotton, the future Puritan leader in New England, and it's actually where an important missionary society, the General Baptist Missionary Society, was formed at Boston Baptist Church. The pictures here show you the famous stump, but also the memorial, uh, again put up by the Congregationalists, in roughly speaking, the sort of location where they might have been betrayed on their attempt to escape, although we don't precisely know where that occurred. An interesting figure in our Baptist history is Roger Williams. Now, of course, Roger and Mary Williams are particularly famous because of their role in founding the state of Rhode Island in the USA. There's some debate, though, about the extent to which Roger was a Baptist or how long he remained a Baptist. But nonetheless, they're an important part of the story. Well, his wife Mary was actually born Mary Bernard in Worksop in Nottinghamshire in area number one. Her father, Richard Bernard, had been at University at Christ College with John Smith and they were intimately connected up until the crisis over separation. Later on, Mary moved down to Essex and there she married Roger Williams. In 1629, Roger came back to Area 2 to visit Semperingham near Boston for the great uh, discussion over what became the Great Migration. Now, therefore, we've got a few interesting things that you can see. You can see the gatehouse where Mary was probably born, and we can take you to Semperingham, where once there was a great stately home, but now there is really just a church left in the field, so there you can see where the stately home survived until a few years ago. But more interesting, perhaps even still, is what happened later, because uh, Roger actually came back to England during the Civil War area, and he came to stay with Sir Henry Vane, the former governor of Massachusetts, at his house at Bellow in East Lincolnshire. This is really one of my favourite spots, a beautiful uh, remote location with the last remains of Vane's former house. Now, Vane and Williams had a mutual interest in theories of religious liberty, and in that they reflected the Baptist's views. Roger 
Williams had copied his words from John Merton of Gainsborough, and he was influenced by Smith and Thomas Helwys in their writings on this hugely important topic. So it's fascinating to come to, to uh, Bellow and reflect on the discussions that may have taken place between these two great individuals, perhaps walking the little country lanes around the house. We now reach area three, the East Midlands, perhaps a little more than an hour by train from central London. It's possible to pick one place to stay in to visit all the locations in this area. But it's an area connected with some real giants of Baptist history. Uh, John Bunyan, of course, is famous for Pilgrim's Progress, William Carey, the famous missionary, and Andrew Fuller, a really influential Baptist organiser and theologian. In the same area is Olney, which is famous for John Newton, the author of Amazing Grace, and well worth visiting in its own right. It's an area that's well served with museums, and there's a very good Carey Experience website, which you can use to guide you around the places connected with William Carey, particularly in the south of the district. Well, the area around Bedford, of course, is particularly famous for John Bunyan, one of the best known names in the world in terms of our local Christian history. There's an excellent museum in the town and much else to see. You can find his birthplace, his home, his baptismal site. And Bedford is only really perhaps less than an hour's drive from Cambridge, so you can visit Cambridge as well while you're there. It's a convenient location from which to visit John Newton's Olney, and also various parts of the William Carey Trail are accessible from Bedford. Now, William Carey is a famous pioneer of Baptist mission, actually one of the best known Baptist names around the world. In Baptist history, he's one of the ones who has the highest level of recognition, uh, perhaps more outside Britain than inside Britain. There's an excellent Carey Experience website, which gives you lots of information on places like Paulersbury, where he was born. And you can visit the Carey Baptist Church at Hackleton and also at Moulton, which is shown in one of the pictures here, adjacent to the house where he famously worked as a shoemaker. So there's lots of information about what you can do regarding William Carey. Note also that at Leicester Central Baptist Church, there is a Carey Museum, uh, and that's a place that will have many, many different Baptist connections, particularly in the 1800s. And there's also information about Carey at Kettering and in Nottingham, where he preached his, his famous sermon, although that church has since been demolished. Close to this area is the church where John Newton was minister for many years, and that's well worth visiting in its own right. Just a little north of Bedford is the town of Kettering, which has a huge amount of Baptist interest. One of the features of it is Andrew Fuller. Andrew Fuller was a great Baptist theologian who was minister at Kettering Baptist Church for many years. Another feature of interest is that this is where the Baptist Missionary Society was actually formed, uh, and that was at what is now known as Carey Mission House, which you can see in one of the pictures here. Fuller became its secretary, and of course Carey became its most famous missionary. The church in Kettering has an excellent heritage room that will tell you all about these fascinating people. And if you want to know more about Carey, Leicester Central Baptist Church, a few miles further north again, has a Carey exhibition as well. Another Baptist connected with this town is William Nibb. He was born in Market Street in 1803. Now his brother went to Jamaica as a Baptist missionary and teacher, and then eventually William followed him there. Once in Jamaica, and William Nibb became a strong opponent of slavery and built a network of churches there. In fact, he was so closely connected with the slaves that when there was a revolt by the slaves, some of his enemies referred to it as the Baptist War, and he narrowly escaped being murdered. Of course, Cambridge is high on the list of uh, places to go for anybody who visits England. 
is for our purposes just a short step really from Bedford where we were on the last couple of slides. Cambridge is famous as the centre of the Reformation in England and it connects with lots of people in our story. Particular connections are John Smith who attended Christ College and Roger Williams who was at Pembroke College. To find out more about visiting Cambridge, speak to our friends at Cambridge Christian Heritage who do an excellent tour and have a wonderful exhibition at the Round Church in the middle of the city. But the person who really stands out in this area is actually the famous Spurgeon. And Spurgeon began his life and early ministry around Cambridge. The area is also the home of Andrew Fuller, who we've mentioned previously, a key friend of William Carey and an important Baptist. He was from Soham on the edge of the Cambridgeshire Fens. And he was very important in 1775 over the arguments over hyper-Calvinism and the effects of that on the Baptist churches. So if you're based in Cambridge, you can actually quite easily go on a bit of a Spurgeon tour around the district. And you might even, even include a visit to Ely Cathedral, one of the most spectacular English cathedrals, standing on its own little hill, which can sometimes appear like an island in the fence. Well, Spurgeon's ministry is relatively recent, and with so much interest in his life at the time, there's plenty to find out and see as you go along. One of my favourite places is to actually go to Iselham, where he was baptised in the River Lark. And my first picture here shows you the actual location where this occurred. You can walk along one of the river banks. Uh, it's a little bit of a, a stretch, a few hundred yards, and you can look across the river to a little memorial that stands on the upper bank on private land commemorating his baptism at this rather out of the way spot. But you can also visit locations where he, he preached, uh, the old church in Cambridge, for example, where he worked in the Sunday school uh, and the location in Tevisham, one of the early places where he began his public adult ministry. You can visit Water Beach, which is the place where Spurgeon was first actually called into the ministry and became minister of the church while still a teenager. The church here has been substantially rebuilt since Spurgeon's day, but it's still an excellent place to visit and a very, very significant place in his life where he really made his name and his success here led to him being called to a church in London. Area five takes us into the country on the borders between Essex and Suffolk. Much of this is actually famous for the artist John Constable, who did a lot of his landscape paintings here. But this Essex Suffolk region was one of the most important centres of Puritanism in Tudor and Stuart England. Besides which, Colchester, which was a very early Roman town, also has the earliest known Christian church in the country. There's much else of interest here as well. For example, Braintree and Bocking had a significant separatist group in the 1550s, which have been seen by some as Anabaptist in style. But the area is best known for Spurgeon, who was born here uh, and first uh, made some of his most significant steps in his life. Uh, and also it's got connections with John Clark, one of the American Baptist pioneers as well. So if you're interested in Spurgeon, there's lots to see. You can go to, for example, Kelverdon, uh, where he was born, or you can visit the church in Colchester. It still actually is a church where Spurgeon was converted. And of course, we've got lots of descriptions of the significance of that. If you'd like to do a tour in this area, we do have friends who run Gateway to Zion tours, and they will help you find out what to do and perhaps take you around. While you're in this delightful area of Essex and Suffolk, there are a couple of other early Baptists who are particularly connected with it as well, much earlier than Spurgeon. And these are Roger Williams and John Clark. Now, Clark was born at West Thorpe in Suffolk and actually christened there in 1609. And that's easily accessible from, say, Colchester, where you might choose to stay. Williams uh, came here 
1629 and married Be Mary Bernard at High Laver Church, which is shown in my other picture here. And of course, we've mentioned him in connection with areas one and two in previous sections of this talk. And so we reach London, although, of course, this is probably where a lot of people will start any tour of England and Wales. Now, London is obviously very important in Baptist history, but because it's been bombed and rebuilt and then rebuilt again, there are very few physical remains of any of the Baptists from before 1800s. So although we know that the first English Baptist congregation was led by Thomas Helwys and met somewhere in Spitalfields, we don't really know where exactly that happened. We know that he vanished into Newgate Prison in about 1615, but even that has been demolished. Some of the sites of the early congregations are known, but they've been many times rebuilt, and so there's nothing really to actually see in that respect. You can find where Newgate Prison once stood, for example, but you can't see the actual prison. One exception, perhaps, is John Bunyan's grave, which is in Bunhill Fields, and which is certainly well worth a visit. Other early Baptists have interesting connections. So Roger Williams, he was born in the parish of St Sepulchre without Newgate. Now, much of that church was burnt down in the Great Fire, but you can identify features of it. Then we have Hansard Knollys, an important early Baptist who spent some time in America between 1636 and 41. Then he came back to England and he had a meeting at George Yard in Whitechapel, where actually he was arrested in 1670. Now, George Yard is now known as Gunthorpe Street, so we can precisely locate it, but it's perhaps more infamous in tourism these days as the scene of one of Jack the Ripper's murders. But for Baptists, it's a very important street. Amongst other things that happened here was the conversion of Henry Jesse, another significant individual. Uh, again, another important congregation would be that at New Park Street in Southwark. This was led by Benjamin Keach in the late 1600s and of course later associated with Spurgeon himself. If you want a full Christian history visit to London, then I strongly recommend you contact our friends at London Christian Heritage. You do an excellent walking tour and also do excellent tours of the British Museum. So now we're in London, of course, we need to talk about Mr Spurgeon. And Spurgeon preached at New Park Street Baptist Church in Southwark from 1854, although he moved to the much bigger Metropolitan Tabernacle a few years later. As I've mentioned, New Park Street was also the home church of Benjamin Keach for 36 years in the late 1600s. Keach was actually persecuted and put in the pillory in 1664, but he survived to be an influential figure in the London Baptist Confession of Faith in 1689. Although you can still find Park Street, you will of course not actually be able to find any remains of the chapel. Now Spurgeon was so successful, he needed bigger premises and the tabernacle was commissioned. While that was being built, he preached at the Surrey Gardens Music Hall. Seven people died there when someone shouted fire during a service. Spurgeon built a memorial hall in Penrose Street, which was destroyed in the Blitz, but has since been rebuilt. And part of the site is now occupied by a, a small park called Pasley Park. So all of these are things that you can actually see. One of Spurgeon's houses near here was 99 Nightingale Lane, not far from the Metropolitan Tabernacle. So lots of places to visit connected with Spurgeon. Later in his life, Spurgeon actually moved out of central London to Norwood, although it's now part of, a, of the endless suburban sprawl of South London, really. And he had a large house called Westwood in what is now, surprisingly, called Spurgeon Road. It's now part of a school. You can also find Spurgeon College in South Norwood Hill. Most interesting, perhaps, is Spurgeon's tomb. 
Now Spurgeon died in France but was brought back to Britain and buried in West Norwood Cemetery in 1892. And as you can see it's an impressive tomb indeed. There are a lot of things that you can visit connected with Spurgeon but there's actually an excellent website called A Pilgrim's Coffer uh, and that offers you a London map of many other Spurgeon sites which you can visit. And certainly one place to visit in London is to net connected with John Bunyan. Now if you're in the middle of London uh, down Farringdon Street from some sepulchres is a place called Snow Hill and it was in a house there now demolished that John Bunyan died in 1688. He'd actually been riding back from Reading uh, in terrible weather, uh, caught a chill, uh, went to stay with his friend who was a grocer and died of pneumonia a few days later. So he was buried in London, although he's closely connected, of course, with um, Bedford. He's, so you can find his tomb in Bunhill Fields. Also buried in Bunhill Fields was Hansard Knollys, who was, who was buried there in 1691. It's actually quite a good location to visit because it's very close to John Wesley's chapel, literally just across the road, which is worth a visit in its own right as well. For Area 7, we've got a couple of places in the southwest of England, perhaps slightly more difficult to visit because they're rather more scattered. These include Tiverton, which was one of the first Baptist churches known to have existed in the country in the 1620s, the others being Lincoln, Salisbury and Coventry. Now Bristol is worth a visit because it has a rich Christian history all of its own. And apart from the Baptists there, we might mention George Muller, who famously ran a charity to look after children entirely by faith means. Money and food always seem to arrive at just the right moment without him having to ask about it. Bristol also has had a Baptist church since the 1640s. William Nibb, who we've mentioned earlier, well known for campaigning against slavery in Jamaica, uh, was one of the people who ministered there early stages of his life. In Bristol is an area known as Baptist Mills, which is said to be one of the places where Baptists were baptised by immersion in the local water. There's a website that you can visit, uh, churchcrawler.co.uk, which has quite a lot of extra information about Bristol's Baptist churches and chapels. So we're particularly interested here in William Nibb. Well, William Nibb and his brother moved from Kettering to Bristol, actually with the son of Andrew Fuller, uh, the famous Kettering theologian. And there they joined the Broadmead Baptist Church. William's brother went to Jamaica first, just after William had been baptised, in fact. William's baptism was conducted by Dr Ryland, the man who'd baptised the famous William Carey many years earlier. For a time, William ran a Sunday school at Stapleton and conducted meetings in Brick Street in Bristol which you can still find on the map. Now the Broadmead Church still exists, although it's been rebuilt many times and it was described by one person as being rather lost within a shopping centre, uh, but it's still there. Of course, if you really want to follow the William Nibb Trail, you probably need to go to Jamaica, where there's a school uh, named after him. One unique place to visit in the southwest is Tewkesbury, actually a very historic town in its own right. But here there's a remarkable building that has survived. Now early Baptist chapels were mainly provided by converting somebody's house and this is a great example of that. So in Tewkesbury we have a house which is actually originally 15th century which was converted into being a Baptist chapel probably sometime in the 1600s. Uh, I've seen one suggestion that it was 1623, but that would have made, been remarkably early in fact, probably later that century. Uh, in the early 1700s it was further adapted to make it more suitable for use as a proper chapel, but after about 1800 a new chapel was built and this place simply reverted to being a house again. Uh, fortunately they did it on the cheap so that the baptistry survived and actually continued to be there underneath the floor. 
Since 1978, it's been gradually restored and is now part of the John Moore Museum in the town. Uh, check their website for opening details. And so finally, we reach Wales. Now, Wales is particularly connected with the Calvinistic or particular Baptists, and you can visit the earliest Calvinistic Baptist sites in the south of the country. Uh, but also, there was a very interesting General Baptist group very early on with Hugh Evans of Lanaya, who surrounded the area of Lanaya with a General Baptist community really from about the 1650s. Uh, as part of that, you'll be able to find Dolau Chapel. The current building at the roadside dates from around the 1750s. Rather confusingly, there are two places with the same name within a few miles of each other. Um, this was typical of the way in which Baptists evolved, preaching at farms and wayside locations, uh, and so a chapel was then built where, the, where they'd become met habitually for worship, perhaps. The, this chapel was a Welsh-speaking one, and then in the other Dolau, a few miles away, they had an English-speaking chapel. That particular community is quite important uh, for American interest because of their connections with a group that left the area and went to Pennsylvania, uh, having met at several different sites around that area. Now, the earliest Baptist congregation that we know of was created in 1649 in the south of the country, particularly in the uh, very beautiful area of the Gower Peninsula. Uh, and the man connected with this was John Miles, who became pastor of the church at Ilston in 1651. And this was a Calvinistic Baptist church. Uh, for a few years during the era of the Civil War, he also managed to hold the living of, of the established church building at Ilston as well. When he was ejected from that in 1660, his Baptist congregation moved to a secluded site of an old chapel uh, in some woods not far out of the village. And this became known as the Trinity Well Chapel. Now you can access this site, it's well worth a visit, uh, but it does involve a bit of a walk along a woodland path. Now Miles eventually left for America and set up a Baptist church in, in New England in 1663, finally settling at the American town of Swansea in 1667. So he had connections with Swansea in Wales and Swansea in America. One of the most interesting Welsh Baptists is the remarkable Christmas Evans. Certainly he would have been an impressive preacher. Uh, his style was apparently extraordinary, but also his personal appearance. Uh, he was somewhere around seven feet tall and for most of his life had only one eye, which clearly had an impact on some of his congregations. Now we know a lot of the places located uh, in his story. Uh, for example, he was born near the village of Clundissel, uh, although the house has been demolished, a plaque was put up on a tree nearby. And in case you're wondering, he was actually born on Christmas Day as well. Uh, his spiritual formation took place in that village at the Ebenezer Chapel, uh, which last time I heard was still standing and was a healing centre. Having lived there for a number of years, he then moved to Anglesey, where he lived at Hlangefni. And so the other picture on this uh, slide shows the building that he's connected with there. And he was very successful in his ministry there for, for many years. After that, he moved to Cathilly in the south, uh, where the chapel that he preached in has now been rebuilt. Then he was a couple of years in Cardiff before returning to the north again in 1832 to the Caosalem Chapel in Carnarvon. Uh, although that you can still find that, it was actually rebuilt in 1855, long after his time. Now, he died on a visit to Swansea in 1838 and was buried at the Bethesda Chapel there, which you can still find in Prince of Wales Road. So again, as a relatively recent Baptist in our story, there's plenty of places you can see connected with this remarkable man. If you'd like to know more about visits, please contact us at Pilgrims and Prophets by email or via Facebook. Our website 
lists some options that you can do, but we also always try to tailor our tours to the particular interests and needs of the individuals. We suggest that you check out as well the Christian Heritage Network UK website. This gives you details of other Christian heritage groups, including in Oxford, Edinburgh and Birmingham. And all of these are genuine groups linked to local churches. We also publish some books about Christian history, which are well worth reading in advance of any visit if you can. You can order them from the Bookworm Web Retford email address given here or from your own supplier. Thank you very much for watching this video and we hope you enjoy finding out more about Baptist history.